Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Tortoise Wins by a Hair, released in 1943. It's the 394th of the series and it's directed by Bob Clampett. You can find this on the Looney Tunes Golden Collection Volume 1 DVD set and on the Looney Tunes Platinum Collection Volume 2 Blu-ray or DVD set. I have links below to those sets. Because it's under copyright, can't show you the full cartoon here on YouTube, but in case you haven't seen this one, this is one of those rare times where we have a sequel to a previous short, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But Bugs Bunny is so mad that he lost the race against the tortoise, so he tries to figure out how on earth did the tortoise win last time. He thinks he's figured it out and challenges him to another race. So first up, you're going to see a re-edit of the commentary track I did before I had to take that down. And that has my good friends Blue Genesai, who is helping re-edit this video, and also my friend Steph Stilly. And after that, you're going to hear some new thoughts from me, including bits that I missed the first time. So, without further ado, let's get into it. And with me today are my fellow bunnies or tortoises, I don't know, they can pick, um, Steph Stilly and Blue Genesai. Say hi, guys. Hi, everyone. I feel like we've been here before. Hmm, it's a possibility. Um, yeah, this is just reused from the um, the first one, which is the Tortoise Beats Hair by Tex Avery. Today, we're going to check out this cartoon specifically, which is my favorite of the three personally, but just got such amazing animation. I just absolutely love it. I mean, look at this animation here by Rod Scribner. I mean, look at that. Uh, yeah, this is the one part of animation I can ID because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really sticks out, doesn't it? Mm. Well, I, I, I think the only animator I can recognize... Yeah. According to Mark Kessler in, in his commentary, which you should listen to after this, is like, if you look at this Scribner thing here, at the very tippy end of this, it just it turns into Bob McKimson just for, like, a split second. Like, there it is, right there. Like, right at the end, um, apparently. But I like how this has like, got, like, a spy thing happening, especially during World War Two now, and we even got... A, um, a prediction. I mean, people say, hey, the Simpsons are predicting so many things. Well, this one predicted Adolf Hitler's suicide by two years. Maybe like I really old like that sign there. Uh... Twerp at work. <laughs> yeah, twerp at work. Yeah, McKimson. That's McKimson for sure. That's... Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and of course, to, to people who don't realize that those were rationing cards where um, certain letters gave you certain amount of fuel that you were allowed to get because of the war. So, yeah. Um, so, Steph, what, what, what are your general thoughts about this one? Um, I like this one. Out of the three, this is definitely the one that I think is the funniest. I like the deviation from the from the character that it takes. And, uh, I saw this first on uh, Turner Classic Movies when I was younger. They used to have like a Saturday morning like cartoon show. And they did a cool episode where they did all three of the, the tortoise versus hare cartoons in a row, uncut, with uh, introductions. And this one's definitely my favorite out of the three. In my opinion, this one starts off, you know, like, it takes a while to get started, really. They're, like, setting up, you know, a continuation of the last time that they did this short. And that takes a little bit to get into it. And yes, the ending climax is really funny. And this is me and other commentators, like whenever Blue has an unpopular opinion, we just bring the hammer out and it's like, um, <laughs> rapid transit, <laughs> boom, rapid transit. <laughs> the ending gag is just some of the fu funniest bit. And I think that's why this one is so remembered. Um, but what I was going to say there what, really quickly was that um, I am the king of the unpopular opinions on this channel. I think this is one of the greats. I mean, I prefer the other one, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Eventually. <laughs> Eventually. And Steph? Yeah, I think this is this might be the wildest uh, bug is, Bugs has ever gotten. I like it. <laughs> Especially with all that wonderful acting that we can see right here. So that was the original commentary done. So in re-watching this, one of the interesting things I've noticed is that this is one of those very rare times that you would actually have a sequel to a previous short. Thankfully, you don't need to have seen the original to enjoy the sequel, it's, but it's similar to later on where Chuck Jones would make Feed the Kitty, where he would set up Mark Antony and Pussyfoot, and then he would have another short called Kiss Me Cat, 
which was basically a sequel to it because the character relationships have all been established. So that's what we're getting here. And again, it doesn't happen too often. But let's take a look at the cartoon from the start for bits that were missed. This one would be considered a semi-cheater because of how Clappy uses about 48 or so seconds of the previous Cecil Turtle short, which is Tex Avery's Tortoise Beats Hair, which I love that one. But as I mentioned in the track, this one's my favorite of the three Cecil Turtle shorts. But at least here, it's used in a very clever way. It reintroduces the relationship that Bugs has with Cecil Turtle. And he gets the plot moving along because he's actually re-watching it at his own home. So it's a good way to reuse footage. I find when Clampett does do cheetah stuff, his stuff definitely tends to be the most interesting in how he reuses old animation or settings. And in fact, it wasn't just a cut and dry the reuse in the beginning. It's all changed up, so it's made out to be like a horse race of sorts, which is commentated on by Mel Blanc doing a typical horse race commentator voice, which was pretty good. Now, we've already admired Rod Scribner's animation in the very beginning once we see that he's actually watched this previous race and he's really, really angry. But I have to say, as good as the animation is, Mel Blanc's delivery of despair and frustration and anger comes across perfectly here, even through his mispronunciation of certain words like physicu and that kind of stuff. Why I'm in the pink. Yeah, I'm an athlete. I got an athlete's physicu. Sure. I got an athlete's legs. Sight me. I even got an athlete's foot. How does that moron do it? I'll find out his secret if it's the last thing I ever do. And I will too. It's absolutely incredible. It's too Amazing elements coming together to form something absolutely incredible. Now, one thing I didn't know at the time, and I've since learned, is that the scene where Bugs is dressed up like an old-timer character with the big beard, so you, even Cecil even refers to him as, hello, old-timer. And that's a reference to the old-timer character from Fibber McGee and Molly, and that was done by Bill Thompson, who is perhaps most well-known for doing the voice of Droopy. And there's even a few lines in there which came from the show like, you know, that's the way I heard it, that, that kind of thing. So that's where that reference comes from. But right away, you see these interesting little touches of, first of all, I love Bugs' knock. I'm going to start doing that from now on if I have to knock on someone's door. But then there's one bit where just for not even a second, Bugs, in a split moment, puts down his beard just to show the audience, hey, it's me, it's Bugs, even though, of course, we know. I thought that was a great touch. And just, it's so quick and so blink and you miss it. Most people wouldn't probably even see that the first time they see this one. So that's no, pretty good. We see a blueprint and taking a look at it very closely, we see the name Michael Sassanoff. And that was Clampett's layout artist at the time. And he helped with the story for a few of his shorts. What's really interesting though, is that you see this thing saying passing wind in the corner. I'm surprised it got past the censors because they would have looked at it then and gone, oh, you can't have that because it's, well, referring to letting off a fart, right? It's so I'm glad that's left in there, though. But that whole sequence, Sassanoff and Clamper would have had to sit down and go, you know what, let's try and figure out a logical reason as to why turtles are better races. And just the whole explanation, as ridiculous as it is, it's very convincing. I quite like the way it was done. And even Bugs is like, oh, okay. Yeah, bunnies are definitely not built for racing and all that. I thought it was fantastic. So we see then Bugs is like, aha, I got the secret now and he's building his own shell. But I wonder what that place is, is building at. Is it like an extra home for him? Or did he boot out some sort of blacksmith from nearby? I don't know. I just thought it was weird, but whatever. It's still pretty funny. Now, apparently, the newspaper that's used has actually been identified because a lot of the times the newspaper would be some weird, weird, random newspaper and a lot of people wouldn't even be sure where it's come from. But this one has been identified as the newspaper from the 1st of November 1942 of the Chicago Tribune. Obviously, the cartoon stuff has been pasted on, but the other bit that's pasted on is that whole Hitler committing suicide tagline which, again, as mentioned in the commentary, it was like a weird prediction because it really did happen a few years later. Here, though, it would have been just wishful thinking, of course. And we see Bugs holding up two ration cards. I had a look into it, and A ration was actually the lowest priority, so if you're just a general civilian, 
living just a regular day-to-day life, you'd have the A ration and you could only fill up your car uh, a certain amount per for whatever length of time. But the C one was given to those essential to the war effort. So maybe Bugs is happy that, hey, I got a C ration so I can actually fill up my vehicle, whatever that may be, a lot more often. And story-wise, this is done so well because of the fact that you've got this wonderful little subplot now of these gangsters that they put their money on the race and they want the rabbit to win, not knowing that Bugs is wearing this newfangled modern design turtle shell and he's surely going to win the race without anyone's help. It's just a great way to set things up for the climax at the end. So the race begins, and I've always loved the animation and also the score involved for when the turtle is racing, how slow he actually is, the bip boom, bip boom, you know, that kind of thing. I've always loved that. Now, we do get repeated animation from another Tex Avery cartoon called The Heckling Hair, and that bit of animation of the swim cap being put on, that comes from there. Is it a big deal? Not really. I'm sure someone in the audience at the time is not going to identify and go, wait a minute, I've seen that before, but anyway. But we see Bugs is so happy, he's like, yes, look folks, modern design, whoop whoop, and he's doing this a really ecstatic and movements, it's absolutely fantastic. Vocals in this are all male blank, except for one voice, according to Keith Scott in his Cartoon Voices book, and that's The Lookout, it was done by Kent Rogers, and Keith Scott says it's a Leo Gorsi type, so I had to look that up, because I wasn't sure, and sure enough, Leo Gorsi was an actor, he would typically play a leader of hoodlums and would have that kind of voice that was done by this rabbit that is the lookout. And these rabbits then catch up with bugs and they're like thinking, yes, we've got the turtle. He goes, you're the turtle, rabbit, turtle, rabbit. And Mel Blank's vocal delivery in that scene is absolutely incredible. Just the despair where it's like, you guys are doing the wrong thing. I'm the rabbit. Then we get the cherry on top. When we pan over and we see Cecil dressed up as Bugs, knowing too well that rabbits aren't exactly bright. So then Bugs continues on and the despair and just the emotional delivery of Mel Blank thinking he's finally going to win, he's finally going to win, and he's just about to cry. Just the delivery there is fantastic. And remember, this is just a seven minute cartoon and yet he's delivering this amazing emotional range for the character. And we get that fantastic end where they once again stop Bugs from winning. They even help Cecil win the race. And sure enough, they're looking on and they're like, oh, we stuffed up. And we get that bit at the end that's usually cut for TV, which is that basically they shoot themselves and that's it. So, yeah. This is a masterpiece by Bob Clampett. It's, it's certainly up for debate as to which of the three Cecil Turtle shorts are the best. Most people would pick either the first or the second one, and I do kind of feel for Freeze because his one's actually really, really good, and I've already covered that on the channel. But I love all three for different reasons, and it's a great way to see how different directors approach the same topic in different ways. This one gets a 9 out of 10. It's fantastic. It's not my favorite clamp, but short, but there's so many amazing bits in here. It's such a wonderful, wonderful watch, and I absolutely love it. But that'll do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, guys. And until next time, take care.